fire. Like wind and rain, fire is an elemental force. We can't eliminate it, but we can make a choice about the force it affects. Will that force live again or not? In the wake of catastrophic fire, will we be left with a phoenix rising out of the ashes or just ashes? While this is what we hope to leave for future generations, decades of legislation based on emotional appeal and not-so-sound science is denying our children their heritage. We're losing land we support with taxes and promise to safeguard. Once joint owners of our public land, citizens have become disenfranchised tenants. The doors to the forest closed while we watch our investment go up in flames. It's a sad legacy we share with decision makers from every state. In the years 2000 and 2001 alone, wildfires cost American taxpayers over $1.8 billion to fight and jeopardized 43,000 people who battled blazes in 16 states. During those two years, nearly 12 million acres of land were reduced to ash and dead trunks. An area the size of New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, and Rhode Island combined. And today, 192 million acres of national forest land is still vulnerable to catastrophic fire, along with the animals that live there. Jack Ward Thomas, former Forest Service chief, writes in a 1998 editorial, the future of this enormous public trust rests upon decisions that we make today. So policymaker, voter, future taxpayer, what will you decide is the fate of our legacy of land? Will we apply common sense rehabilitation to quicken the healing process? Or do nothing and keep the forest doors shut for centuries to come? But before you choose, understand what you're choosing. This one was a fairly small catastrophic fire, as they go, dubbed the Star Fire. In the summer of 2001, it consumed over 3,000 acres of private land and 13,000 acres of forest service land, all of it taking precious wildlife habitat. What's happening right now on that land is typical of what happens in burned forests all over the country. Sitting side by side, private land and forest service land is treated differently and will be dramatically different places to live, to visit, to work in a decade from now. Left untouched after a fire, sometimes for years, as the law prescribes, Public forests often yield only loss. Lost land, habitat, resources, lost access. It doesn't have to be that way. I'm Bob Suter, I'm a private consulting forester representing the landowner that lost approximately 3,000 acres and 15 million board feet of timber. Immediately after the fire was out, we started salvage logging removed the merchantable timber, have now come back and cut down all the submerchantable timber. All timber harvesting in California is controlled by the California Forest Practice Act. The state of California and the Department of Fish and Game realize we have an emergency situation here and allows us to start harvesting as soon as the fire is out. In contrast, the Forest Service has conflicting regulations which prevents them from immediately going in and harvesting timber and it will probably be another year before they are able to enter their land. For now, all that's allowed on Forest Service land is the removal of hazard trees that might fall into the roadway. But so what? Why not leave the trees alone and simply let nature treat the fire damaged land without human intervention? Why not? Insect infestation, for one. Kenny Dean, Wetzel Oviat Resource Manager. This is one of the reasons why it's important to remove the timber after a catastrophic event. This tree, uh, the bugs got to it, and as you can see here, the, the pine bark beetle has completely stripped the cambium layer, and when that cambium layer is gone, the tree is dead. It takes very little time for these bugs to enter into this, this heart. And the insect blight spreads, finishing off even those trees that might have otherwise survived the fire. 
Insects are one reason to rehabilitate the land. Condition of soil is another. Experts know that after a catastrophic fire, forest soils begin to decrease. And what was once an area that used to support large trees for wildlife habitat, now can barely support brush. If erosion doesn't wash away all of the remaining soil that might even support brush. We've had two major storms, um, total about three inches. And this is what happens uh, after a, a catastrophic fire. When we get a wall of water coming down that hill, and there's nothing to stop it. It just breaks through the crust. It just takes out all the ash and soil with it. And we, we have a big problem. Down here, you can see where the ground was undisturbed after the fire. There's just six inches of goo, which fills with water and has a tendency to cause sheet erosion. We've disturbed a lot of the soil to get rid of the ash. And we've already noticed in the disturbed soil that many of the seed fall work their way into the loose soil and we're hoping for some natural regeneration next spring. Uh, the alternative to what we're doing is to just leave all the timber stand and let it uh, rot on the stump. Uh, this may take 200 years then for the trees to fall to the ground and reestablish the soil. Maybe the land will be healed and habitat restored without intervention. If there's no drastic wet weather, if lightning doesn't strike tender dry trunks still standing, maybe in 200 or 300 years from now. With habitat and the wildlife and humans who depend on it, time is the issue. The question isn't so much, will habitat be restored? The question is, when? We're hoping here to speed up the process by planting it next year. We hope to cut the process from the 200 years it would take nature down to 80 to 100 years before we have a new forest. The question is also, will displaced wildlife and the humans who access the forest wait two or three centuries for nature to do the job alone? No, not all of them. So, among these refugees who should return with the earliest grasses, which will we sacrifice to keep a silent dead forest intact? In a 1998 editorial he wrote, Dr. Chad Oliver tells us, the idea that forests will thrive if left alone has already produced catastrophic results in the form of diseased trees, overcrowded forests, threatened species, and wildfires. Where no rehabilitation takes place, some animals will never return because they've moved on in order to survive or because our decision not to speed up healing has pushed them to the dark side of the endangered species list. Just as it is for wildlife, time is also the issue for forest resources. Quickly salvaging burned, dying trees is the key to making use of the resources, whether on private land or forest service land. John Farrell, Wetzeloviet Forester. What we have here is uh, logs that, have, that we have purchased from the forest service under a timber sale called the Red Hot Hazard Tree Fire Salvage. All of these logs came from the Star Fire. The, uh, the Forest Service was able to sell this shortly after the fire simply because the environmental assessment work had already been done. So if they had not had that in place, uh, the, these trees would probably have set there until next fall. But the product that we have here, because we got in early, is still very good. A year from now, this will not be the case. So, wasted time equals loss. Lost timber sale tax revenue, to keep schools in rural counties running, to fill the potholes in transportation budgets made by cuts, lost revenue to offset the cost of national forest management. It's estimated that the U.S. Forest Service lost upward of 180 million board feet of timber in this fire. That's uh, an average dumpage price of just $200 a thousand. That's over $36 million of lost revenue to the U.S. Treasury. Dollars that could have defrayed the cost of fighting the Star Fire. 
a fire that when less than half contained had already cost the government nearly $8 million. Wasted time also means less wood for products like houses, which translates to denied opportunity for those least able to afford the loss. As less wood is available, the price of lumber goes up. Maybe it only adds $2,000 to the cost of a new house. Maybe letting that burned lumber rot only means 100 low-income urban families are kept out of the housing market. But that's 100 human beings. By utilizing these trees before they deteriorate, we can capture that value and that, that resource will move from the form of a tree into the form of a house and live for 100, 200 years. If we do nothing, all that value is lost. So that's the tragedy as I see it. A tragedy of well-meant intentions colliding with reality. In spite of policies that we hoped would yield healthier forests by letting the land heal on its own after a fire, disease, insect infestation, and forest fuels have increased along with catastrophic fires. Add our diminished capability to respond to those huge fires, and we have a formula for a future that looks like this. But there is another picture of the future we can choose. In 1971, lightning sparked a wildfire in Hewitt Meadows and on neighboring land. While Hewitt Meadows was rehabilitated in 1976, the rest of the burned land was not. Take a look at what nature can do in only 26 years when people are allowed to help. Back then, it was just common sense to do what the land itself taught people about restoring forest health. Remove most dead trees to stop blight from spreading. Break up the soil. Spread slash to stop erosion and provide habitat. Replant, then nurture seedlings as they grow. Hewitt Meadows and neighboring land show clearly what happens when these principles are applied after a fire, thanks to the intervention of people who cared for this land. Hewitt Meadows thrives. But the lands consumed by the Star Fire, Cerro Grande, and the Bitterroot Fires, the fate of these national treasures is still uncertain. Once proud inheritances, they await our decision to use common sense, to go beyond politics, to rise above rhetoric embraced in the name of love for the land, rhetoric that says people are the problem in our forests. Untouched nature is the solution. The truth is, catastrophic fire, not people, is destroying the land. Catastrophic fire, not people, is taking habitat, taking resources. But with people helping nature, good things happen. Like the collaborative effort between the government, the public, and special interest groups, all of which care passionately about the land. Bob Smart former district ranger with the Forest Service. Common ground is huge out there. When you take people with opposing views and we all walk out there in the forest, the one common thing we recognize is we love the forest. It's amazing how many solutions you can start to find out there. People united with the environment are the solution. It's gonna require responsible leadership. People need to start pulling together and recognize that the forest that we cherish is at risk. The good news is, Together, we can help fix it. But we need to act quickly before fire and time render more forests useless and lifeless. Don't let ours be a legacy of shame.